Hello, and welcome to this Rain Taxi virtual event. I'm Eric Lorber. I'm the director of Rain Taxi. It's a great pleasure to be with you tonight. If you don't yet know about Rain Taxi, we are a nonprofit organization that champions aesthetically adventurous literature. We do this in many ways. One is that we put out a magazine every three months, and we have just released our 101st issue, building on 25 years of service to the literary community. Uh, another thing that we do is events like this one, and uh, we have a whole host of those coming up this spring. Uh, we've been having great fun, so please uh, tell your friend, friends, check out our website for more information about upcoming events and uh, other ways to connect with us if you'd like to become a member. Uh, it, we are very privileged to receive funding from the National Endowment for the Arts and the Minnesota State Arts Board, among other sources. But our greatest funders have always been individual supporters in the community. So if you would like to, there is a donate button at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to chip in there. Um, lots of ways to interact on the screen, in fact. Uh, you can use the chat. We see many of you are already chiming in, and that is really great. Keep it coming. Um, you can ask a question tonight by using the ask a question box. And we're going to collect those during the talk and bring them back to, at the end uh, to see uh, what questions you can bring into the mix here. Um, and then finally, you can buy the book. And this is the book tonight that you would be want, want to be getting. It's just been released today. Uh, and we're really thrilled to have the author of Places of Mind here with us for this rich conversation. Timothy Brennan, uh, actually the author of several other books of literary giants, uh, among them Salman Rushdie and people like Hegel. So uh, certainly someone who has uh, explored richly intellectual history uh, over centuries. Um, talking with Timothy tonight, we are so privileged to have uh, the composer and musician Nico Muley. Uh, I, I know that many of us here in Minnesota and perhaps from where you are uh, have seen Nico perform uh, and uh, before you know live performances uh, went away for a while. We look forward to them coming back and uh, and to perhaps catching live music again. Uh, meanwhile, we're just delighted to have uh, this conversation tonight and uh, uh, both of these gentlemen knew the subject of our conversation, Edward, and, and of Timothy's book, Edward Said, and uh, I look forward to hearing more about uh, that as we explore uh, this uh, brilliant biography and, um, and this life of clearly uh, an intellectual giant of our time. So without further ado, uh, please welcome to our screen Timothy Brennan and Nico Muley. Hello. Thank you, Eric. Um, good evening, everyone, uh, and hi, Tim. Hi. So um, I think we should just dive right in. Uh, and one of the things that I feel like is the, is, the, is the appropriate thing to start with is why this book, why now, number one, and number two, what do you think is the ideal reader of this book? What is the, what is the amount of, of pre-knowledge um, about Saeed and his work that you think a reader of this book might have, should have, won't have? I think it's a symbolically fraught time to be reading about Edward Said, given what happened under the Trump administration with the, uh, you know, more or less outright claim that uh, all Palestinian territory should be annexed outright by, by Israel. And then, of course, to make Jerusalem uh, the capital of Israel. So both of these would be times that it would be good to go back and remind ourselves about what Edward did and how he changed the conversation over Israel and Palestine. So that might speak to the timing of the issue. And I, I have to say, I've been really amazed that with all of the years that have intervened, uh, Said matters still so much and still is capable of uh, inspiring as much ire as he does, as I've uh, witnessed recently. So that's one thing. The ideal reader is, uh, it's a very good question. I myself in the writing of this book didn't assume that anyone would have known anything about Edward. Clearly, there are some parts of the um, you know, readership out there that really care a lot about Edward who only know one aspect of him, for example, who might only have read his memoir out of place. This would be true probably in much of the Middle East, 
where that's his best-selling book and where his work as a literary critic probably isn't known at all. So I was very conscious in the writing of the book to think about all of those different constituencies, you know, the people who, you know, Palestinian student organizations, journalists who were probably his antagonists at one point, you know, in um, uh, the pages of the New York Times or on the nightly news who care a great deal about his political persona and his reputation, but probably haven't read anything about uh, the ideas that formed him. So a lot of my work was just uh, try explanatory. I was, I was attempting to put things in a popular way so that people could understand the ideas that motivated him and, and, and saw the biography, not only, only as the telling of a life with all of the personal anecdotes and color that go along with that, but to create a drama of ideas that's a, that's a I, I you you would know best. It's a great way of of describing your book, and I think for for those of you who haven't read it yet, um, what is extraordinary about it is that there are various points of um, ingress to it. There there are various ways in which you can kind of dive in. Um, but what's what's curious to me is always the relationship between autobiography and a life. And I'm wondering if you could talk about that a little bit, specifically with with Said, who's who's biography as it was sort of printed and known was subject to so much um, detailed scrutiny. You know, I think the minute anyone starts looking up your school records, you've entered a different a, a different register of kind of biographical interrogation. So I'm wondering if you if you can talk about, because, because as you say, um, out of place, his his autobiography is, it was written at a, at a time of intense personal um, strife and also, set out to very subtly shade and nuance and correct misapprehensions that, that people had had in various accusations. So I'm wondering if you could describe very briefly the, the relationship of that book to, to what, you've, what you've written here. Right, thank you. I mean, it's, it's important to know, first of all, that Edward tried twice in his life to write a novel and that the writing of the memoir took over for his second attempt at writing a novel. This is one of the reasons that it is so novelistic and, and really uh, Proustian in its intentions. Uh, these are words that he used uh, to describe it himself. Edward experimented quite a lot uh, in a number of different genres. In order to be a public intellectual who could get his points across, he felt it was important not only to write in one key. So one of the keys that he wrote in was the autobiographical mode, writing long pieces for the uh, New York Times Magazine, for example, for Harper's and others before he sat down to write the, the memoir as a whole. Edward was in therapy his whole life. He obviously had some issues that were familial. Uh, he did not get along with his sisters. He uh, portrayed his father in a, a rather dark and disturbing way that none of the documents or correspondence that I came across, nor the uh, the stories told by uh, his relatives and friends really, you know, corresponds. Uh, it doesn't correspond. So there are important differences between what Edward decided to write in his memoir and what I write. Uh, he, uh, he didn't write, as I say, anything about his sisters. He had almost nothing to say about the very important, intellectually important marriage, which was a very fiery marriage to his first wife, Myra Janice. Uh, he says almost nothing about a head-on car crash that is a fatal car crash that he had with a motorcyclist in Switzerland and uh, a number of other things. So, you know, Edward was someone who, like anyone, I suppose, sitting down and writing a biography, had emotional impasses which would prevent him from seeing certain things that other people could see about him. And just speaking personally, one of the, one of the most uh, surprising and uh, I don't know, enriching moments of the research that I did was reading those transcripts uh, and those dossiers of his student years, because it's the first time that I, at any rate, uh, and, and nobody else has seen them, right? So it's the first time I saw the personality of the young boy who is filtered through Edward's mature uh, lens in the, the uh, memoir itself, it's the first time I saw the actual language and patterns of thinking of the young boy in his application letters, for example. So uh, it was something that I could see was at variance with what he had written in the memoir. That's a that's a wonderful way to put it. And I think, I mean, you've also uncovered 
uncovered um, some poetry he wrote in in uh, in, in earlier times, which if, if you want to just, just go through the book and, and look at the poetry, it's kind of extraordinary. What one I, I, I noted down begins, uh, or one excerpt that you, that, you, um, that you provide here says, the world does not tell its time from the East, which is such a fantastic, fantastic and relevant kind of, um, you know, precursor to, to much of his work. And I think, but I think that's important to, to talk about in, in, you know, your, your book is much longer than, than his autobiography. Um, and what becomes clear from the opening hundred pages of your of your book is that indeed there is there is the the looming presence of the father, there is the mother who sounds that not that she not just that she was intense but that their relationship was particularly intense. There is this car crash which I hadn't read about and which I found kind of shocking in about sixty five different levels, um, and then there's also the way in which his his biography let's say as in his autobiography his story has political currency right it's not just this will explain this piece of scholarship this will explain this it actually means means a lot it means a lot like how many days of the year were they in palestine versus in cairo it means a lot what the schooling was like it means a lot all the languages that were spoken at home and these things are really fascinating um to yeah i i i reread out of place right before right after i read your book and, and it, it is amazing the the way the overlap is a lattice work, and there are some moments when there there are definitely still still sort of blockages. And I'm wondering if you could talk about the the word negotiation appears a lot in in what you've written. And negotiation is a, is a is a good one, right? Because it it feels like something that can be very Frenchly untangled and problematized forever. Right, and I'm wondering if you could if you could present me with a few working definitions of the verb negotiation, the verb to negotiate in this context. Well, I mean, Edward was a fearsome opponent. If you crossed him in print, uh, he probably is best characterized overall by his mollifying indirection. That is, he was tactful to the point of evasion. I would say as a practice. But on occasion, he allowed himself, given the outrage he felt by people who had defamed him, to express himself in print in a way that just tore the heart out of its uh, out of his opponents with uh, a rhetorical barrage that was ferocious and uh, beautifully done and very entertaining, but scary, um, really. And old fashioned too. Like it, it felt like you would you would read about people doing that in the sort of you know late 19th century, but the fact that it was happening in an office on 117th Street was kind of shocking. <laughs> yeah, right. So I'm, I'm bringing this example up because it's, in a way, the opposite of negotiation, just to emphasize that, uh, as he wrote also in a late essay, uh, where he talks about the importance of defiance and of taking positions, that there was time to negotiate and there were times not to negotiate. So I think that negotiation takes a number of different forms for him. I mean, clearly he was in fact uh, the de facto go-between uh, between the PLO and the US State Department under two different US administrations, uh, both the Reagan and the Carter administration. So he, he literally was a negotiator, the, the, the go-to person in fact, because he wasn't formally a member of the PLO. He was this urbane spokesperson who understood American culture implicitly and therefore was uh, kind of an ideal representative since he was also trusted by the PLO leadership and could, could perform that function. He's um, you know, beautiful and assuaging and persuasive. Uh, so he had the talents of a negotiator in, in those respects as well. But I would say that probably in his professional life, he was very clear about not making enemies needlessly, not naming names, attempting rather indirectly to address the problems that he felt were going on in the in, in increasing addiction of uh, the humanists in the university to an arcane, jargon-ridden language of theory when they were really abdicating the responsibility as public intellectuals. So uh, he certainly would, would, would address those issues, probably no more forcefully than in this wonderful book of the early 1980s that he wrote when I happened to be studying with him. Uh, called the world the text and the critic, which is this assault on the the abdication of intellectuals within the university. So 
these would be some of the ways in which he negotiated. I think also though, it has to be said that part of it was, as I said before, evasion. I mean, his first book is on Joseph Conrad and really what that book is about is the wearing of masks. It's about hiding yourself. It's about inventing a persona for yourself in your own writing. That's what he's getting primarily from Conrad, which is not what most people would expect. And I think he did that because what was really going on in his mind was way out of step with what most of the profession around him believed. And he had to speak for a while in code. I mean, code is a, code is a, is a fantastic um, th through line actually through, um, th through this text. And, 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 code shifting is something that now i think we all we all can acknowledge we all sort of know what that means and i think that it's something that that um exists in his life and work very explicitly that he that he writes about in terms of it, it it's a flu it's a fluency to be able to do it but it also indicates um a deep discomfort in oneself right if you have to code shift it's feels it feels difficult um but if you can code shift, code shift, it feels virtuosic, and that to me also also um, brings up another way in which it felt like there was often a virtuosity to his confrontational um, behavior. And if just thinking about you know in covering Islam when he sort of go, comes for Judith Miller and and Thomas Friedman, you know at at that point that's a kind of that's a kind of almost unnecessary like cadenza of virtuosic takedown. <laughs> Right. It feels it feels like, you know, it could have it could have been done in a simpler way. But he says, no, 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 no. we're going high romantic, full <laughs> cadenza of this thing that I can do. But but similarly, like going back to earlier negotiations, um, I'm thinking of negotiations in childhood, right, where it's navigating um, dual senses of identity and navigating um, navigating a sense of being always in the slightly the wrong place at every at every moment and i wanted to find um you said uh at other times when he tried to negotiate his mixed feelings as an american he was inconsistent he had internalized his father's upbeat take on american culture and certainly found success in the new world like his father as an improviser experimenter and self-inventor he even found bright spots in the otherwise bleak landscape of the mccarthy decade did not President Eisenhower force Israel to leave the Sinai Peninsula, ceding the territory to Egypt? And you and you go on describing this kind of incredible um, state of suspension between not just two locations, which is an easy way to think about it, but two mentalities of looking at the world. And I wonder if you can if you can help me sort of tease that that through line through his life a little bit more. Yeah, um, I've made this point to others before, but it's really important to know that the 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 name he gave, the title he gave to his memoir, his autobiography, as you were calling it, um, Out of Place, only came right at the end. And so the way he had thought about it and the way he referred to it was by a different title, Not Quite Right, which is kind of interesting because it doesn't explicitly allude to being not in one place, but another, which is in the nature of your question, but more the feeling of being uh, out of sorts and awkward and uh, feeling insecure and, and even uh, imperfect everywhere, no matter where he was, no matter what he did. So it wasn't all about identity and ethnicity or, or those kinds of questions. It was about being at war with oneself and driving yourself uh, to a point of uh, exhaustion because you simply had to do more because you hated to sit still. He could not sit still, nor could he be alone. This is something that you must know about Edward Said. In regard to this being you know, in the United States versus being in Palestine, uh, I think there's a couple of things that are interesting to say about that, about you know, this being between places. Number one is that he actually, there were dividends for him in living in the United States rather than in the Middle East, that it was giving him a perspective about how the American news cycle functions, what the American cultural manias are, how the American public needs to be addressed. All of these he considered to be vital because that's where the Palestinian issue was going to be won or lost. Uh, the greatest abettors and enablers of Israel were uh, was the United States government. And therefore, to affect the opinion of the US citizens was a primary goal and directive. This was a message he constantly tried to get across to the PLO leadership. So this not being of the place literally um, was 
an advantage in some respects. Um, number two, he, he was born and raised an American citizen, even in Jerusalem, in Cairo, because of his father's uh, being a citizen. So he, he was, in fact, uh, out of place in this sense. But he did, in fact, uh, consider seriously moving back to the Middle East in mid-career, early to mid-career, not to Palestine, per se, but to Lebanon. And it's only his wife, Mariam, who persuaded him that this would not be a good move partly because of the, res the resentment and the infighting that one finds in you know, academic crowds. He already was a big name. He was coming from an Ivy League school and people were not going to really open their doors to him there. It would, it would have been pretty, pretty uh, backbiting filled. So, so there's, there's those kinds of uh, problems. Um, so I think that he is someone who um, decided in the end not to go back to Palestine. And there's a reason why? Because some of his his associates, some of his his comrades in arms, like uh, Ibrahim Abu Khod, did late in career give up their U.S. academic jobs and move back to Palestine. So we have to remember that first of all, for a long time, he wasn't allowed to go back, and Israel has not ever you know accepted the right of return. But number two, so much of the Palestinian experience is to be in exile. And therefore, it doesn't make him inauthentic not to go back to Palestine. He's authentic by not being back in Palestine. And I think that's the point he makes in that wonderful photo text collage after The Last Sky, where he emotively and subjectively uh, writes his responses to these marvelous photographs by Jean Moore about life in the occupied territories. And he frequently gets the facts wrong. And people have like pointed that out as though it were a sign of uh, his errors. In fact, it's a, it's a confirmation of his intentions, which is to say that my only experience is one of longing and projection. That's, that's a, one, a wonderful, uh, again, through, through line through, through what you've written. I, I also want to ad address the uh, invisible readers that, that there's a, your, the way that you draw Abu Lourdes work um, and relationship to Said through this is actually really, really interesting. And it's, it's worth, a, a very deep dive, which I only barely started, but the idea that Abu Lourdes, um was able to kind of articulate a form of general, not general, but but third world um, political insurgency coming from the Francophone, um, the Francophone universe. And I think something that's very difficult for people in my generation to understand. So I'm, I'm almost 40, um, but, you know, one becomes politically aware kind of in late teens, early twenties, is that there are these these complete holes in American education about you know colonialism and decolonization and the various forms of resistance that not just occurred but that are still occurring, and the 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 French situation is so unique to French colonial enterprise, to Belgian and to and it's it's almost never discussed in in um, at least in, in sort of basic um, American education, but even even actually in in the context of if you were to take a post-colonial even theory course that that focuses on on South Asia, French information would sort of creep in peripherally. But that was always something that I feel like Said, because this was a, a formative uh, mentor, there was always that present is is that separate um, but incredibly important. For, form of of resistance, um, I'm wondering if we can if we can switch um, tack for one moment and talk about something uh, about exile that you said that that um, you know that's that's a permanent state of of the Palestinian experience, right? Is is that that exile is built into that identity? Um, and the, in an interview that Said gave, he says that that exile affords you. Um, not one set of eyes, but half a dozen. Uh, the aspect of the person who's looking at it, being whatever subject it is, and has always seen it. And then, as you're looking at it now, you can remember what it would have been like to look at something similar from the place in which you came. There's a doubleness to that experience. The more displacements you've gone through, the more experience seems to be multiple and complex and composite. And I wonder if you can talk about that where suddenly you have the identity of being all, always out of place directly applied to the act of observation, not just of the of a political reality, but of a word or of, of a sentence. Right. 
You know, um, there's this wonderful image that you and I have talked about already uh, that he uses at one point later in his career. It really comes to the fore in this book, A Culture and Imperialism, his last really big book. And that's this uh, this term, the contrapuntal, right? So it, uh, it's this musical image of counterpoint. Maybe we can talk about this uh, mm -hmm. later in a different context, but I, it comes up to me here because I think that Said was, of course, a Palestinian, and he was also equally an American from the very beginning. So he, he was these two things, and he was these two things equally, so that even his really close friends who are entirely on his side, who live in the Middle East, in Beirut, and are, uh, their, their academic careers are entirely there, have said that if you talk about any one of us, you're gonna talk about people with multiple identities. And of course, Edward had them too. But if you ask me what is the one that he primarily was, I would say he was a New Yorker. <laughs> So um, what I'm getting at is that I think that because of his role as this eloquent spokesperson for the Palestinian cause, that it's frequently the case that we want to think of the notion of the double vision that you're talking about in terms of ethnicity or country of origin. And I don't mean to diminish that. That is, of course, very important in so much of what Edward wrote from beginning to end. What I think is important though, is that Edward lived this amazingly compartmentalized mental world. So that um, to those of us who knew him and had long conversations with him, it was very clear that he had this capacity to be totally on in conversation and to make you feel like he was entirely there and absorbed in everything you had to say for about five minutes. Uh, and then his mind wandered elsewhere because his mind was always working I wouldn't even say stereophonically. I think it was four or five different things were happening there at once. Um, there's so many different things he's doing. Every morning he got up, um, he's on the one hand at five o'clock in his you know, study, uh, scribbling longhand out the pages of his memoir. Then he uh, comes in and makes you know, coffee. And then he begins a series of 20 minute phone calls, about five or six, you know, to people who are calling from the Middle East and, and Europe. This is the nature of his day. Then there's the, the swimming, there's the tennis, there's the teaching, there's the people calling from the UN, many, many different lives. And I think that double vision, triple vision, quadruple vision, he was someone who had to think about lots of different things at the same time. And he managed to do so with, 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 with remarkable results, although with it taking a toll, I think, on his emotional well-being. So what what you said, and I can I can now pick up this pick this up a bit as a musician, is to say that one of the one of the more difficult things to grasp when you're learning an instrument uh, that isn't the piano, right? So an instrument that plays more or less one note at a time, is that what a pianist has to do is maintain control over not just one line, but sometimes two, sometimes three, sometimes four. And it's not about the number of notes, it's about the actual shape of the line. And each line, when separated from the whole, has its own identity and could be played as a piece of music on its own. And you see this, of course, in Bach, and you see this in Buxtehude, and you see this all over the place. And you see this in, not just as a reality, not just this music contains counterpoint, but counterpoint as practice, and counterpoint as a way to organized material where opposition doesn't necessarily mean conflict, but it means conversation. And it means, um, you know, like a concerto is sort of contratante, right? Where it's a, it's a sort of, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a nonviolent conversation in a lot of ways. And one of the ways that one learns to do this as a, as a musician, and, and I, I was about to say as a young musician, but you know, as recently as three and a half hours ago, you're learning something on the piano, yeah. you, you have to figure out, are you gonna separate the voices and think about it horizontally? Or are you gonna treat it bar by bar and, and think about it vertically as just what am I actually technically doing? And that I think is, is one of the things that you, that you write about so eloquently in, in his work is that there are both, both methods of, of uh, in this case, reading and existing, existing simultaneously. And that's incredibly difficult to do. And as you say, it takes a toll. Um, and there's a way in which your your brain is kind of exhausted by it. And one of the things we talked about the other day um, 
which I think is is so crucial um, and something that I always you know wondered as when I was when you know if you're reading a a, a, a book of his about Jane Austen or something and you realize that that afternoon he's written a very intense op-ed has done a million talk shows and you know the question one one would ask him as many did was how do you reconcile this and how do you how do you um, how do you square these two things coexisting? And he gave an interview um, in which he writes, um, how do you reconcile interest in literature and my very urgent interest in political events, which are always traumatic, tragedy, loss, dispossession. You let them operate. It becomes an enclosure or a common space. The main category is human experience, all is a jumble. They're all there. And your role as a mind, as an interpreter, is in the end creative and you allow them to continue and your role is to see them operating together and allowing them to play off each other and you record that. <laughs> and he's not writing about music there, but that's the most eloquent mm -hmm. description of music. And part of me wonders um, if you could talk a little bit about when he's writing about music, is he actually writing about Palestine? And when he's writing about Palestine, is he actually writing about music? And in a sense, it, it undoes a little bit the idea of compartmentalization or it, it suggests that there is a kind of secret tunnel between the compartments that that might be larger than we than than we think on the surface. Right. I think there was some bleeding of the one into the other, but for the most part, I guess I would I would emphasize the the image that I used a minute ago: compartmentalization. I think it would be an injustice to Edward to think of these these various endeavors that he was involved in, these various areas that he, in his own way, mastered. Right, a music critic and a literary critic and theorist and public persona and media personality, musician. Um, I think that they really were each pursued according to their own lights and that it was possible for him to momentarily tune out, as it were, to use another musical image, some of the rest of it. Of course, there were you know, overlappings, of course. He, he, he often would, in fact, illustrate to his students um, how a, a narrative works by taking them to his apartment and playing musical pieces, which tell stories in their own way. And so that the structure of music was in this case used to explain uh, the structure of narrative. So that kind of thing can be found. The thing about Edward is that he, he really, um, it, it, like I said, his mind was kind of like this computer that was always on. So like he, for a long time, the things that he really would eventually write out as essays were just bothering him. They're going on in his head. He wasn't taking notes. He wasn't uh, uh, planning to publish X with such a title in such a, a place. He just, it was there and it was bothering him. So at a certain point, after it had reached a certain uh, a, a critical juncture, he was forced to get it out. And when he did get it out, it poured out of him. So, I mean, he, he wrote, wrote his essays in three days. Right. So, minor revision. I mean, it's at least a lot of them. So, um, yeah, I think, I think though, when it get back to the point of, of this particular musical image, uh, the contrapuntal, in my view, it's important to recognize that he, he came up with that in response to another and competing image, which was then very popular in post-colonial studies circles. And that was the idea of hybridity. So hybridity, you know, suggests a fusion of differences, right? It's like a, a new being is created with the traits of two intertwined strains. Um, the contrapuntal as an image is very different. It, 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 as you were saying so so well, it's so interesting. I'd love to hear more from you about this. Mm -hmm. um, the it's a it's an image of separate and independent lines of force. You know, different paths that happen at various points to meet. So it, it expresses a very different politics. You know, what the, the, the figure in post-colonial studies at the time who uh, was popularizing the image of hybridity was uh, Homi Baba, of course. And um, they didn't really get along, I think, Edward mm -hmm. and Homi Baba politically. <laughs> one, one, one shouldn't imagine so. <laughs> and, and like, you know, but, you know, it's fun. They're completely cordial with one another professionally, and he would never, ever think of uh, attacking him in print, although he did once, indirectly. Um, but, you know, of course, like with any person, they say things off the record with more frankness than what they say um, in print. But I think that, the, you know, this notion of hybridity as Baba used it, along with other 
uh, words, uh, terms like mimicry and sly civility and so on. This was a suspicious move, I think, from his point of view, uh, politically. It, it, was a, it, it was like allowing um, the acculturated students and professors who were already accepted by the mainstream and thriving in elite institutions uh, to still res retain the status in their own minds of victims of colonialism, right? So it's like, we're not really Harvard professors sitting on the board of major foundations. You know, we're really uh, something else. We're, we're like the victims of a racist Eurocentrism. And in a way you could say, well, isn't that Edward himself? Isn't he guilty of that? But I think the, the whole point is he isn't because he, he, he turned the attention away from, from what one is to the notion of what one thinks and what positions they take. And, and therefore, you know, the image for Edward when it came to the post-colonial had to do with uh, the establishment of independent states and uh, fighting, yeah, fighting with independent you know, it's not it's not a it's not a quarrel with modernity. It's 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 like uh, something that's much more in the vein of the anti-colonial liberation movements of the 60s and 70s. But this is this is a, a a fantastic, and we we could go down this this rabbit hole for you know all the all the way to Easter, but it, it's an interesting thing because as you say, what one is versus what one thinks versus what one does, um, you know, it it was very easy and reductive with with Said, and again, I'm pointing towards you know the reason people felt so compelled to interrogate his biography with such you know day by day detail, that he was he was playing with that game a little bit, and that and that to a certain extent there had to be some small elisions of biography in order for his his political work to make as much sense as it did and i feel like for instance traumatic car crash in switzerland is very different than traumatic car crash in gaza and th that there's a there's a large and an important difference and i think is this is also worth worth pointing out that you know money does something to one Yes. And the presence of money in in early childhood, and the presence of, I mean, just you, we, you know, as as people who've gone to Colombia, it, it's like there there's a there's a sort of universe of the international wealthy, where a certain amount of identity um, vanishes into the into the ether of having a lot of money, <laughs> and and I think and 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 in in, in an interesting way certain forms of racism themselves enter the sort of deliquescence. So for instance, with the, with the Middle East, where you can do the thing that Europe always does, right? Where we claim Egypt as European when we want to. And I say we, that's not, not what I mean, but like, for instance, as classical musicians, we claim Egypt as Aida is a European story, right? And we claim, um, that that version of Arabia, as long as long as everyone has enough money, then so I'm wondering if you could just talk very briefly about that because I I, th I think it is important to say that you know when when one hear when one thinks about sort of you know strict Palestinian um, revolutionary movements, it's very easy to use the 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 horrifying racist Western narrative of it's just people kind of you know wearing military clothing you know scrambling through rocks. It's actually a very different thing. Than than his his experience and and I also would just like to say what a story that you tell that or that appears both in your book and in his um, is about one of the ways that he registered his family's economic decline right was by by thinking about one of his uncles who used to be so well dressed turning up sort of threadbare and that to me is so fascinating because um, there's so many other ways to do that so I'm I'm wondering if you could elaborate on that a bit yeah it's funny that you pick that particular um, example because that is the very um, kind of situation that he articulated beautifully in the one completely done short story that he wrote called An Ark for the Listener, which is a beautiful, beautiful piece of work. He submitted it uh, unsuccessfully to the New Yorker in 1965, but it's precisely on that kind of point. Anyway, about Edward and money, he grew up a child of privilege. He grew up the son of a businessman, but you have to understand that he wasn't in the higher echelons of Kyrene society because of that. It's not clear how much money came from this. He was clearly affluent, but uh, he wasn't the upper crust. Uh, so he was the child of a man who owned 
with his brothers, the Standard Stationery Company, which meant that they supplied everything from typewriters, pens and papers and office equipment, both to uh, the uh, British uh, forces who were occupying there. So he had the British concession. Uh, and he also, of course, supplied all of the schools in Cairo, or at least many of them. So um, clearly there were profits to be had here. They had three branches of the business but he shared it with his uh, his brothers. So it, it's not clear how much money it was. The thing is that there were other things that mitigated against wealth here in some of the ways that you were suggesting, Mika. I mean, he um, he's not he's he's new money, not old money. That's one thing. He's what we, we that would have been called a Shami uh, in Cairo at that time, which is to say an immigrant from greater Syria, which is how the Palestinians would have been thought of in Cairo in those years. He was not simply a Christian, which would have placed him in a, a kind of minority, but uh, of a tiny sect or a denomination of Christianity in Egypt, that of the Anglicans, which is, of course, the major faith of the British. So um, there are lots of things militating against uh, his status, even though there was, of course, that money. The other thing to say about it is that, you know, for well or ill, Edward disavowed privilege in some uh, ways. He would complain about his his own uh, weakness for wealthy clothes um, and uh, tailors and saying, how can I possibly justify uh, you know, a suit that costs 500 pounds when so many people go hungry? And so he beat himself up and, and of course his friends would step in saying, no, no, it's okay. You, you deserve it and, and so on and so forth. So there was that kind of thing. At any rate, it shows his humanity. But in in his own writing, he often mocks himself for his fancy clothes and, and and complains about the cocoon of privilege that he lived in when he was growing up. So he's he's aware of it and he tries to thematize it and tries in his own way to militate against it. Because you know the fact is he he didn't really like expensive whiskeys, he didn't like expensive wines, he didn't like expensive restaurants, and he used to brag a little bit about never owning any property. You know, he, he was a renter until he died. He didn't even own his car. Uh, he leased his car. So this was at least, given uh, the general wealth uh, that surrounded him, uh, a small act of uh, a protest, I guess. Uh, and I thought it was it, it was endearing, if not entirely convincing. Right. No, I, I mean, I think it's it's something important to important to note, especially you know now in a kind of posthumous context. Um, the last thing I wanted to bring up, I th and I think we should open it up for questions relatively soon, um, is about a larger form of counterpoint. Um, and this is something we, we, we touched on when we spoke before, which is something that I that I find frustrating still about the way that um, readers my age and younger think about the presence of literary criticism, let's say kind of literary theory, is that it takes away from one's pleasure in reading. This is of course an absolutely absurd argument that you know is, <laughs> is a fake thing. But one of the things that I wish um, could be, I wish Said's work could be sort of weaponized to, to prove is that you can in fact read Jane Austen with two simultaneous lines or three simultaneous lines of counterpoint, which is to say, again, it's it's um, it, interpreting notions of coexistence and human agency, as he says, that you can talk about it with delight in language and delight in plot, but also ask yourself the question, who is paying for these people's lives? And I'm wondering if you can if you can talk a little bit about that that more kind of meta sense of contrapuntal reading. Right. I think most people think of contrapuntal reading as he used it as just a call for a more open-ended, uh, democratic and inclusive way of reading. So that uh, it isn't that uh, one would have their own particular interpretation of the meaning of a text that they would foist on others, for example, or they wouldn't be going into a text uh, in order to express their opposition to certain views that the author was expressing uh, without having actually taken on uh, their point of view in its fullness and richness and attempted to kind of live through it experientially. You know, And, and I think that that isn't wrong. I think that that is one of the things that he's really trying to get at, but that it doesn't completely uh, cover 
what he really wanted to say. Um, I think that he's he's somebody who also was very suspicious of counterpoint, and he often uses the the image negatively. Uh, he, he thinks that there is a, a way in which the the, the the pianist performers like Glenn Gould, who could play Bach with such mastery, they in a sense were forced to play God um, in his in his view because it was a kind of a rules bound, uh, structured, stricture like uh, way of approaching music um, to demonstrate virtuosity primarily, right? A kind of mathematical virtuosity rather than what music should ideally be. And, and, and there's that element as well that I think uh, frequently gets forgotten. So I'm not sure that that gets entirely what you were getting at, but. Uh, well, it does. It doesn't. It, I mean, that's that. That's a very. That's a. That, that's a handy way to think of it. I mean, it is. A, it is again that if you're going to use a nuanced metaphor, like such as counterpoint, which again is something that, you know, is definable, but also something that anyone who works in any field that deals with it wrestles with every day, that you will run up on the, the sort of edge of how strict an interpretation, how mathematical interpretation. Um, yeah. You want to apply to it, and that that is that is something that that applies to I think any way of of reading literature. Like if you if you're going to go at a text with a specific kind of I'm going to do a uh, you know really specific sort of post structuralist work to this thing, or I'm going to do exactly this kind of reading or that kind of reading that that you know the the minute you get to Glenn Gouldy about it, you know for for better or for worse, that then you then you end up in a sort of problematic. Um, Problematic zone. I wonder. I wonder if we should open this up for questions, or if there's anything else with it that I've I've sort of lazily breezed past that you think is important to know. I mean, I think it's difficult because the book is so rich, and and what I, again I would I would uh, urge everyone to do is that when you are reading it, you will make a thousand notes, being like, oh, I should reread this. Oh, I should reread that. And it's not just all of of Edward's work. It's kind of other things that are that are kind of in the in the periphery. And I think that's that's one of the wonderful things about the richness of it. Yeah, I just there was one thing because I didn't really address this, uh, and it was part of your question. So let me do so now. Uh, literary theory, literary theory, literary criticism. Of course, Edward was very invested in it at the beginning of his career. Less so as time went on. It was always something that was important to him, but uh, not in the way that it was understood within the academy. I, I'd say after about the early 1980s. But there was so much that. Um, people were overlooking within literary studies when he was, you know, apprenticing him, himself in that field, that uh, it was a really kind of intellectually dead, where people would just simply read poems closely and not care at all about history or the author or, or, or the world, you know? And, and so I think that literary theory to begin with was a way of bringing continental philosophy, which is something every student as an undergraduate should learn about and, you know, get straight in their head. It's a part of their general knowledge. That was one way of getting the, the important and neglected thinkers of, you know, Europe uh, over the last uh, three or four centuries into the curriculum again, you know, because the philosophy departments weren't doing it. The philosophy departments were filled with British analytic philosophy, common language philosophy. And so there was no place for this to do. So he wanted to shake up the intellectual world of literary studies by bringing these ideas in, not so much because this or that theory about linguistics or the text or the image or discourse, that wasn't so important. What was important is tackling the problems of philosophy and, and thinking about how that disciplines a, a certain mind and makes one alive to differences and changes. So one can, as a, you know, you said people in your generation are rather um, skeptical of it and they think it ruins the experience of literature. You know, one can do their literary theory naively or they can do it knowingly. And, and really the point is, is that you, you, you don't, one can't approach every individual book you pick up as an entirely new event. It's, uh, it's obviously, it, it fits into a genre, it fits into a tradition, it fits into certain modes of argumentation. Theory is nothing more or less than seeing those patterns. And, and mm. he was very, very good at, uh, at at making that kind of point well. That's a wonderful a wonderful thing to say. I mean, I think he, I, going back to I, um, an interview he said where he, talking about coexistence, talking about all these things, you have to watch them operate, right? And and theory in as its practice in, in, a, sense, in a sense is watching, you know, at, at its basest interpretation by me, um, is watching a sort of machine that does one thing, right? 
even if it's a complicated thing and he 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 says it's it's up to you to try to hold them together uh that's where the effort is i never see myself as a solver of problems which i think is so great because it's sort of you set these things in motion you allow these things into the space that you're in and you watch them do the work that they're doing and your job is not to do hybrid synthesis but it's to be aware of the contrapuntal activity that's going on within the, the text that's before you, whether whether that text is your life or or music or- it's Beautiful, or, great quote, great quote, yeah. I, I love that so much. I, I should tattoo that on my, on my <laughs> eyelids. Um, Eric, I wonder if you can come back and and uh, and, and join us with some some questions from our, our guests. I, I'd be delighted. We have some excellent ones, but first a, a great deal of thanks to you both. This has been such a wonderful conversation about a wonderful book. Um, and I think we're really getting a picture that it's, uh, as with any great biography, it goes uh, not only into one person's life, but into uh, an entire milieu and worldview and and uh, and how important and rich that really is. Uh, you know, someone asked a question that uh, I think actually would apply to both of you because um, you share that you both uh, knew Edward Said personally, you studied with him. Uh, and are there ways um, that Said's thinking informed your own, informed your own approach to how you uh, to how you view uh, your own writing and your own composing? Uh, uh, yeah, Timothy, why don't you start? Well, absolutely. I mean, inevitably, maybe even obviously. I I guess I learned many things from Edward. I never had his talent for making the right choices. He always made the right choices. <laughs> And one thing one notices about genius is that they make very, very difficult things seem very, very simple. And that's not true of me either. But I remember having a specific conversation with him, right, as he had published this book I alluded to, The World, the Text, and the Critic. So this must have been about 1983. And um, I admired what he was doing. I told him why. And he said, look, I'm not an artist. My job is merely to get ideas across clearly. That is hard enough to do and that is all i want to do so it was one of those beautiful moments he is an artist he was an artist he was writing fiction he uh is a performer of the piano he has these uh, refined aesthetic sensibilities that come up most in his music criticism but it was interesting to me that he constantly sacrificed that if i could put it that way right that he sort of martyred himself on the cross of aesthetics in sense of uh well actually he martyred aesthetics on his own cross i think that's the better image in order to um talk about a history that happened and how the reading of secular texts is important for politics and about the narrative that everyone needs to tell about their own life. Those kinds of ideas were much more important to him than art, art appreciation. Yeah. Makes sense. How about you, Nico? Yeah. Um, for me, I think it, it's being able to hold in, in the same space. The, the thing that I always think about with, with, in one of the classes I had with him, his ability to diffuse um, nonsense was amazing. And I think a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of my, my peers and, and colleagues and even me to a certain extent, you know, you expected at that time um, for someone such as, such as Edward to be really interested in a kind of traditional theoretical analysis of a text that had that was really like weighed down with information and really informed by every kind of au courant like you know it, it was assumed that you had read every piece of homi baba from top to bottom and then from bottom to top and then reversed and you know in 15 different fugal configurations um and his ability to take any sentence that you said that was kind of filled with this this kind of i would say sort of squid ink in the water of discourse and just clear it and demand um, plain speech about mm -hmm. what it is that you were addressing was incredible. And I think I think about that all the time when I'm writing about music, which is to to kind of it's a it's a version of reading the room where you think, you know, why are we why are we talking about this piece right now? Like what's the what's the function, what's the function of this conversation? But then it's also about just not just don't bullshit. <laughs> like, just be just be straight with things as much as you can, and let and let the light be on the text that you're analyzing. And again, whether or not that's an anecdote about your life or music or or and I I do think about that all the time. 
Yeah, that's that's really um, fascinating. And I think it actually leads into another question because um, your conversation tonight really uh, uh, wonderfully explored, as the book does, uh, the kind of uh, diversity and multiplicity of Saeed's interests and how they uh, converge and, and diverge. Uh, but I think for so many readers, uh, Saeed is associated with, um, uh, uh, has a major association with the concept and the, and the playing out of post-colonial studies. And, um, and maybe, uh, uh, Timothy, if you could talk a little more about that, that relationship and that, that sort of, um, how that field developed in the light of that work, you know? Yeah, I think that um, it was enormously freeing for people to read Orientalism. It was kind of an inside joke almost, you could say, with uh, people who are non-white scholars or people from former colonies who, uh, trying to uh, teach and uh, learn in the Metropolitan University. So there's no question that it's it's triumph, right? It's 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 uh, achieving, as he pay, as he puts it at one point in the book itself, mass density and and, and referential power, was one that uh, made it impossible for the university not to open up its doors uh, to a greater extent than it had in the past to those same non-white scholars. So it had enormous demographic implications. People poured into the university now because it had become not only popular but really de rigueur, you know, to a bring in a critique of colonialism and, and imperialism and to broaden the canon. So there's no question that there is a causal relationship of sorts between the success of Orientalism and the rise of post-colonial studies. This is not to say that there wasn't a lot of tension between uh, Edward and post-colonial studies. There certainly was. As I said a little bit earlier in our conversation, Edward was very much a child of the anti-liberation movement. Uh, many, many of his uh, qualms with the arcane uh, nature of literary theory, you know, the thinking of Derrida per, per, per particularly was something that he abreacted to. A lot of that, that critique that he had of literary theory was directly influenced by his reading of Amilcar Cabral, right, uh, who is, uh, you know, a, a revolutionary from the, the, the 1970s. Back in South. So this gives you an idea of the utterly different formation and intentions politically that he had from post-colonial theory, which was increasingly bound up with post-structuralist theories of identity and difference, which, as I said before, was primarily interested in a critique of modernity, right, which he's invested in. I mean, Edward uh, was schooled under the Nada intellectuals, that is the intellectuals of the Arab Enlightenment. These are the people that he is aspiring to. Their, their beat is to embrace modernity and to give uh, Arab uh, uh, intellectuals a way of, of achieving it uh, by, by uh, tactful borrowing from the West, but by uh, staking out their own uh, independent uh, culture and initiative. So, in so many different ways, he's at odds with it. He never would come out and speak against it, of course, because its general influence and effect in the university was salutary. So he, he did love it. But again, mostly off the record, he was quite scathing about many of its leaders. Yeah, oh, thank you for that, that, that rich answer there. And, uh, you know, tonight and, and in the book uh, as well, uh, you both brought up um, uh, uh, other other interests and other creations of Edward Said, uh, fiction, poetry, uh, and and so uh, one question is: Oh, are are those available? Uh, are there plans to have them uh, available for wider readership? Uh, on a similar note, uh, you might uh, uh, be among the people who've heard his. Uh, piano playing. Uh, are there are uh, ways for other people to hear that? Or uh, and yeah, so uh, his other creative uh, output, yeah. Right, well, I, I do reprint um, a couple of his poems in full in the biography. They're great, it's so, it's so ridiculously fun. <laughs> right, there's one in particular that I think is is gripping because it, it seems 
to allude to his uh, rocky first marriage. So at any rate, it's 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 interesting psychologically to read this poem, and I think it's quite well done. Um, so that's one way. Um, of course, the Edward Said papers, where all of these things can be found, including his drafts of a novel, are are not uh, closed to the public. So anybody, once the COVID days are over, can go and read them that way. Um, I am uh, arranging or organizing with uh, Edward's uh, widow, Mariam, um, a possible selection of his unpublished essays and some of his fiction and poetry. Uh, so that is a possibility in the future. It's not yet formed, but that's something that we've, we've actively talked about. The musical performances, yes, he did perform in the early 1990s, both at uh, Columbia and at Georgetown. And I, I'm sure that there are recordings of that. I certainly heard the recordings when I was doing the biography, but I, I think that, that they can be found uh, through, through Columbia University. So that would be interesting. What you probably won't be able to find, though, is him as a very, very young man, as an undergraduate at Princeton, uh, playing uh, with another uh, performer, a Bach piece, uh, with, from, to my ear, uh, and I do play piano, um, just incredible dexterity and lightning quick uh, expression, but he was quite an accomplished pianist, let me put it that way, particularly yes. when he was Indeed. younger, when he was younger. And when he would get together with Baron Boim, they would sit down and play together, and they, and they, they would play as equals for that moment, although Edward was being a fan of musicians, uh, Nico will uh, recognize this, um, very deferential to uh, Baron Boim. It's, it's almost as though Edward in his relationship to musicians, because he is so invested in music, you know, he, they were just sort of like godlike in a way for him. And th there's a side of him that wishes he could be them. Well, I would, I would also say that he, he does have, he gives himself a certain kind of aesthetic probity about this. And he... <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> and and uh, that was uh, no doubt going to be a a, a fascinating uh, a follow through. But uh, uh, thank you, Timothy. Uh, this was really really great. Uh, we didn't get to all the audience questions, but I want to assure people that some of them are uh, in fact gone into uh, in the book. Uh, it's just out today, and uh, readers listening, you can buy it by using the buy the book button on your screen. Uh, Otherwise, go to your favorite independent bookstore. Um, and uh, Timothy and Nico, who may be able to hear us in the background, uh, I want to thank you again for such a rich conversation and such a, a terrific book. Um, uh, we welcome it into the world. Uh, to our audience out there, don't forget to visit our website, find out about our new issue and the other events we have coming up. Take care, everybody, and good night.